That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Comic Reviews. I'm your host, Sid Part 2, and I have a, uh, kind of a small stack again today. Only three books, but kind of some long ones, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the last thing I read this week was Deathstroke number 10. Um, so I was kind of just not... I wasn't really enjoying the book, I'll be completely honest. I thought it was okay, it had some stuff that was interesting about it, but overall I was just like, yeah, this isn't really working for me, Tony, Tony Daniel still isn't the best author ever, but this issue I did enjoy the most out of the uh, three issues I, I read. I believe this whole arc really started with um, issue number six, or no, four issues then. Um, so in this issue, we, we have Deathstroke defeat the Titan, um, Lepitus, or whatever the guy's name is. Um, whatever. Um, yeah, so this, yeah, Lepitus. Um, so we have him finally defeat the Titan, and Superman and Wonder Woman kind of go and solve the other crises that were coming up because of the guy and so deathstroke just gets a cool sword fight with this dude um and this is this is what i can tell is is what tony daniel's really enjoying about the book is he just gets to to really create some really crazy situations and have some fantastic art for it because i can't lie this first spread page looks amazing Tony Daniels' art is never the problem on a book that he's on. I just don't think he's a very strong writer. And this issue works overall. It's okay. And he certainly has a a voice in mind for Deathstroke's character. So I'm fine with that. Um, Wonder Woman and Superman are just kind of there. So that's... I mean, that's a little disappointing. It's weird because they, they go so far to put him in the story. And then they're not entirely useful. Um, and then he has to contrive a reason to get them out of the story, um, so that Deathstroke can fight the guy on his own. Because you'd assume Wonder Woman would be much better at killing this guy, but... Whatever. Um, there is one line in this that I absolutely loved. Um, so it's the opening page where Deathstroke's describing the entire situation. And it's like, it's all really, really bleak. But then he goes, I mean, it's not all bad. The sword I got is fucking awesome. Um, that's really funny. Because, I mean, he's got this sword that's changing shapes. So that's kind of cool. Sorry about that. Um, no, but so, like, this this has its moments. It's it's not, like, poorly written as I thought it'd be. Or it's not terrible by any stretch of the imagination. It's just really not my kind of thing. Um... Reasons you'd want to pick this up is you're an art over story kind of guy in comics, which is fine. I actually understand that mentality more than most guys do. I'm just not. So the art in this is fantastic and it's definitely worth picking up. If you love Deathstroke, you're probably going to get it anyway. Um, so that certainly gives you reason to pick it up too. And if you like the, the whole kind of like crazy over the top epic situations, this is probably a good book for you to pick up, or at least this story arc. Um... For me, however, I just find Deathstroke more interesting than he's, um, kind of like the ultimate assassin, which this certainly is getting to, but I think it's too far out there to the point where it's, it's just not plausible anymore because there's, like, he just killed a titan and fought off Wonder Woman and Superman because he had a good sword. That's too far for me. I think Deathstroke should be a, kind of like a Punisher level character or Daredevil level character where he's he's good enough to keep up with the big names but he can't juggle them all at once. Um but the issue does end with um the gods demanding a sacrifice of blood from Deathstroke for the fact that he killed a titan even though it was them that set him up to kill a titan whatever. Um he demands uh, a sacrifice from Deathstroke, and so he pull. Instead of risking his children, he pulls out his eye. Um, so we're getting Slade back to you know what he's famous for. He's de-aged a little bit right now. 
Um, and, and like they regenerated him. I think they might have mentioned something about a Lazarus pit. And so he's, he's DH. So, I mean, like I said, this isn't like great. This isn't incredibly, this is, certainly isn't my thing, but it's still enjoyable. Um, if I was a bigger Deathstroke fan, I'd probably enjoy it more, but I just think Deathstroke's kind of okay. He's, he's a cool character. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and go on. Batman Annual number four. Um, I have mixed feelings on this for very obvious reasons if you've heard me ever talk about Scott Snyder's Batman before. It helps it's not written by Scott Snyder. But God, everything that guy is doing to the Batman universe right now is just too much. Um, so... I don't even know why Batman's on the cover of this, to be honest. Um, so apparently Wayne Manor was Arkham Asylum for a while there. I don't know. I'm not saying that it didn't happen. I just certainly didn't get that impression from reading anything after Endgame. Hi. Denny snuck in. You're the sneakiest lizard ever. Anyway, um, excuse me again, I just, I'm getting interrupted left and right on this video, aren't I? Anyway, sneaky butt. That's right, lick my toe. Um, so, so apparently Arkham Asylum took over Wayne Manor, which, I don't know, that's just a really weird idea to me. Um... But they use it, they do get some mileage out of it, I gotta give it that much. Uh, and it's given back to Bruce Wayne now, but the vil three of the villains, namely Riddler, Clayface, and Mr. Freeze, stowed away to, to torture Wayne. And I guess it's kind of tying into the whole Batman Inc. thing, which once again, this doesn't feel like it's... Cause Bruce Wayne was at such a big character point by Batman Inc. This feels like it's just completely ignored most of that. Um, anyway, uh, this... That's so weird. So the villains are mad at Wayne for funding um, Batman's crusade, as it were. And they're upset that he doesn't remember that now because Scott Snyder, being the soap opera Batman writer that he is, gave Bruce Wayne amnesia. I just wonder if he's going to remember his evil twin brother that's a zombie assassin. Um, so yeah, so they're upset with him for having um, funded Batman. For years on end. Why they're not upset with Tracy Powers on the. Uh, Garcy Powers? Whatever her name is. I'm gonna start writing down characters' names. Is it Gurry? Gurry Powers. Um, one thing I guess I have enjoyed about the, the Snyder run in the comics so far is the fact that they're, they're bringing the powers and Batman Beyond stuff into. Got like present Gotham as it were. I really like that Powers has been around for a while. Um, I by far my favorite moment from any Scott Snyder Batman book was a couple years ago during a Clayface issue, oddly enough, where he's in a trash compactor with nothing, um, like no gadgets or anything, but he finds an early prototype of the Batman Beyond suit just sitting in a tr trash compactor. Which makes last week's, or the last issue of Batman Beyond's ending make even less sense. Um, but whatever. Uh, so that was, that was cool, but this is a very ridiculous, um, situation. I, I don't know, it's just a weird idea that, that Wayne Manor was Arkham Asylum to me. They, they do get some mileage out of it. The, the villains are upset and they say, oh, it was torture being in 
the place where our enemy that had given us all these scars to see his name everywhere. That's that's fascinating. Because it's weird, because you think the villains know that Bruce Wayne was Batman, but that's not the gimmick they use. I'm like, okay then. Um, what's annoying is, this is the kind of story that people were afraid would happen when Bruce Wayne, in the last issue of um, Grant Morrison's... Was it... I don't think it was Return of Bruce Wayne, but one of Morrison's last issues on one of the main Batman books was him announcing Batman Inc. And then it got into that. I remember people complaining about the idea that, that Morrison's was going to set up this Tony Stark level character thing for Bruce Wayne where he's constantly going to be getting kidnapped by villains who want to get at Batman through him and yada yada yada. Um, and so that's basically what's going on here so i'm I, I, i've been really negative so far and i don't want to be so i'm going to talk about one of the things i really did enjoy about this um they talk about moving everybody out of arkham asylum all the the inmates out of the asylum and into uh wayne manor or no out of wayne manor and into different penitentiaries across the state and stuff um, and the really interesting thing they do with Riddler is they don't want to give him the chance to escape, so they just cut out his cell from the physical structure of the house and move that. That was pretty clever. Um, and I also like the way in which Riddler is written in this issue. Just being reasonably clever, but... Like that kind of mastermind level that that put this all together and gave these other two guys the the chance to get it, um, Wayne, who they all have an equal grudge at. So that part of it's work used well. I'm not gonna lie, um, and it certainly does keep you guessing about the uh, the nature of why they're they're mad at Bruce Wayne. Do they know he's Batman? That 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 does kind of drive you through the story. And and for me, I found that kind of tedious and annoying because I'm like. They're not going to do that. DC's not going to let them do that. Um, but at the same time, I was really disappointed by the fact that Riddler never truly tells a riddle. Um, Riddler isn't Clue Master. He isn't Moriarty. He's the Riddler. His gimmick is that he tells riddles. So to write a story with him, I do think he's still written well, but you could have done something else in this story to make him feel like the Riddler more than like generic mastermind Batman villain. Um, and like this, it, he isn't a good person to choose because the, the question that they keep asking him, um, let me find the exact answer, the exact phrase in here. So I have... I have one for you, and so I have one for you right now, the easiest, hardest question anyone has ever asked you. What are you? And that's the question that they keep referring to throughout the um, issue until Bruce Wayne admits, I was crazy. Is that, that's what you wanted to hear, right? I'm crazy. Um, and so that they get to that, and they, they go into Snyder's thing about having Batman go to um, Arkham to get electroshock therapy because he thinks it would help him back in... I think that happened in Zero Year. Again, we just went through this with Morrison. Um, the writer is doing his best to build on the stuff he's given, but... Just, we already had this stuff to build on. It's so frustrating. Um... So yeah, so like, and of course Bruce Wayne manages to, to save everybody in the end without having to become Batman again, which is, I guess that works. Um, but once again, why is Batman on the cover then? Because it says Batman on the cover, I guess? I don't know. I have mixed feelings on it. Obviously more negative than positive. I just don't like the direction they're t they've been taking Batman in lately. It's really lazy it's really poorly done it's based on a lot of contrivances and cliches 
And it just doesn't feel like Batman at this point. And that's really frustrating. And it makes it really hard to get excited about reading comics right now. And I gotta be honest, I am getting on the verge of putting down... Uh, of getting rid of all my Batman books. Because this is the last one I've held on to. Because everything else, just I couldn't keep up with it because I didn't like it. Or it ended. This, however... It's just too much. It's it's getting to the point where it's work to read through a Batman comic. And I should never feel that way. <sighs> On to the book that I did enjoy the most this week. We're finally getting back to form with this book, but I'm going to start out on a negative note. Because this is weird, and I've never seen a comic book do this. Doctor Who, the, adv the, the Doctor Adventures, the, the blah, 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 restarting. Doctor Who, the 10th Doctor Adventures, year two, issue number one. There was a year one. Um, it's a comic book. You couldn't just keep the numbering. You had to change it to year two. Why? Um, like, honestly, I went into the store today, and it's a good thing that I always check the stands and don't just grab my list. Mostly I do that for you guys to see if there's anything else that it might be interesting to hear me talk about. But also the doctor looks like David Bowie on this cover. Um... But, like, I, it's a good thing I checked the shelves because my store didn't pull the book because Doctor Who, the Tenth Doctor, is now over. And this is a new book. And so they thought it was a new book. I don't know what to do about him. Stop. I want attention. <laughs> Talk about me, not about comics. Um. Anyway, so now the idea of of doing a of changing the numbering like that—it's just weird and pointless i think there might be a new team on this whatever still I don't, I don't understand the reasoning behind that um so yeah we got 10th doctor adventures number year two number one um and quality wise we are back to standard with this book i really didn't care for the whole anubis alien plot thing of last story arc and that went on for quite a while it felt like so i'm glad to be done with that and back to something of consistent quality it looks like and, and what i like about this is it is moving the last story arc really dragged this thing is kicking along really nicely um this is only going to be a two arc story they say because it's got the singer not the song part one of two um but really, we move right through this, and it, like, it's, it's building quick, and I kind of called some of it, because maybe they were going too fast with some of the details they were given, and they didn't have you, give you time to kind of sort of forget about things. Um, this probably could be dragged out to three issues, and, and it would feel a little slower paced, but it might pay off for it in that way, but... Honestly, I don't care because the quality is back. I'm, I'm enjoying the story again. The Doctor's written well. The story's unique and innovative and it deserves to be in a comic book. Um, not that the last one didn't deserve to be in a comic book. Uh, that I'll give it that much. But this, like, the, the opening pages of this, like, this first spread we get is this city in the clouds that's got, like, these weird 
gas gaseous uh cow things up in the sky it's it's really cool it's really brilliant and they talk about things that you just you can only think about you can't experience which i really like you can only consider the experience you can't actively participate in it um like the comics have that advantage which is something i really like because you'll have um movies and television shows and such where you're actively participating in the experience of listening to what's being said and, and seeing what's on screen and so your imagination doesn't have to kick in to to fill in everything that the characters are talking about it's all provided to you through your other senses whereas in comic books you you have the art to fall back on but a lot of it just comes through what's being said and so this is really capitalizing on that on making you fill in the gaps and so they talk about things or they talk around things which is what i really like they um they they talk about imagine this and that's kind of what it's like um and that's really fascinating let me see here i'm gonna go back a little bit that's a scary monster that's what you look like when you're all mad at yourself in the mirror. Um. <laughs> Alright, so like Gabby has this. She's always writing in her diary or her letters to Cindy. Um. Cindy. Imagine the dreamiest, silkiest voice ever. A voice like music. Cindy, the Shanti are natives of the planet Wapatak. You know who explained that... Voldemort explained that they're a race of conceptual beings. I don't know why I said it like that. Of conceptual beings. It's in bold. They're a race of conceptual beings. Beings, Danny. A race of conceptual beings. Um, composed of incomprehensibly tiny mathematical shifts in quantum foam. Except they don't need to be observed. They need to be heard. You can't see them. But if you listen, they're like that unobtainable music you hear only in dreams. Faint snatches of the most beautiful, intricate melodies. Sometimes repeated, but faint, distant, fading in and out. Always just out of reach. That is not only great use of making your reader imagine things in the comic book format, but it's also really just well-written prose, which is, it's great to see those two things ma married in a comic book. This is some of the best um, Doctor Who stuff I think we've had. Uh, nothing against the, the show lately, but I've, I've gotten, not tired of Moffat, but I'm, I'm getting to the point where I want to get past Moffat's shtick in Doctor Who. And this is exactly the kind of stuff that I needed um, to get past that. I'm still excited to watch the new series once it's all finished coming out. Um, but I'm I'm happy that we've got something that's more um, experimental with the Doctor. And, and I really enjoy that about it. Um, and then, uh, as always, it's just great to see, you know, the 10th Doctor again. I missed him. Tenet is my Doctor, so I, I really did miss him. Um, and this is... The way he's written in this is spot on, and that's really fun. Um, I'm enjoying this more than I did the Four Doctors. Not that that was bad or anything. It was just it ended up just being okay. Uh, and he's off to be a brat again. Um, but yeah, this is really great stuff. If you're a Doctor Who fan and you pick up comics, add this at least to your poll list. Go ahead and add the other books, too, because I'm certainly considering it. Um, just great stuff. And and then there's, of course, I never want to forget to mention the comics in the back. These are some of the funniest, most enjoyable, just awesome Doctor Who things ever. Rachel Smith does a great job writing these, and, and I really just get a hell of a kick out of them. Um, I highly suggest picking these up. Uh, and yeah, that's, it, there's not a ton to say about the issue yet. It's, it's really great. It's really in your head, um, cerebral stuff. And that's enjoyable as hell for me. Uh, 
But everyone, thank you very much for watching. Until next time, I'm Zipper2, and I'll be reading comics, I guess.